resurrection power didn't just happen to Jesus only, it happened to Jesus first. That means that you and I don't just celebrate Easter, you can experience it today. Some of you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, man, Aaron, this sounds so good. I want to believe this is true, but knowing who I am, I don't feel worthy. The Bible says that that same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can be at work in you right now. Come on, we're still celebrating what God did last week at Easter. Celebrating with 224 brand new brothers and sisters in Christ who went all in through baptism. Isn't that incredible? And you know, it's extra meaningful because of this, the season our church is in. And if you were around here last fall, we introduced a, a two-year initiative we're calling Awaken. And we're seeing God, and Easter was, a, was an evidence of that, of God answering the prayers to awaken his church. And so you, you can go to our website, learn more about Awaken. Well, good morning, church. My name is Greg. I get to be one of the pastors here. We want to give a special welcome to any of you joining us online, as well as any of you that are here for the very first time. We're honored that you would spend some of your weekend with us and want to invite you to, yeah, we can give it up for our first time guests. Yay! You see, we're happy that you're here. We want to invite you to stop by Info Central in the lobby. There you can get a gift as well as any answers to questions you may have about what a next step for you could be. And maybe you're here uh, returning from Easter or you've been around a couple of weeks. You may be asking the question, uh, how do I get connected around here? And for you, we would encourage you to sign up for Rooted uh, today. Today is the last day for our spring Rooted session. It starts April 16th. And Rooted is a 10-week experience designed to help you connect with God find community and discover your purpose. And we can't recommend Rooted enough, so be sure to sign up today. Well, hey, right now, I can see you're already on your feet, ready to worship. The Bible tells us to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And that's what we're about ready to do. You guys ready to worship? Are y'all ready? We're ready, so let's go. Good morning, church. Man, the celebration didn't stop last week. We're gonna continue it this week. Let's get those hands together. Let's sing this together. Here we go. Praise when outnumbered And I'll praise when surrounded Cause praise is the waters That my enemies drown in Come on, let me hear you say this out As long as I'm breathing Say I've got a reason to praise
and one is that we're breathing. Let's put that breath to good use and give us a praise. Woo! I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise. Praise cause you're sovereign. You're sovereign. Praise cause you reign.
Maybe there's some of you who have been struggling with anxiety and depression and it's been hidden for a very long time. Maybe some of the closest people in your life don't even know that it exists, but you've been suffering in silence. I want you to know that Jesus is here in the room right now. He says He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. So the Lord is in the room right now. And that means there's healing here. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So whatever you're bound by, the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. So there's freedom in this place right now. Come on, so Lord, I pray right now that you would break every single chain. God, would you set the captives free this morning, this morning, in the name of Jesus. Oh, sing this with me. Strongholds bowing to the Savior, resurrection power over every circumstance. His word stands final. this morning. How about you go ahead and make this place feel like home? Would you mind turning to your neighbor and just saying hello and good morning and then you can go ahead and have a seat. everybody across all of our locations and those of you joining us online. Today, we're beginning a new series of messages and we're gonna jump into that in just a moment. But before we do that, I wanted to come out here and take just a few moments to honor uh, my predecessor, uh, the man who served as our lead pastor for over 24 years, Howard Brammer. I wanna honor him today because a little over a week ago, just right before Easter, uh, Howard went home to be with the Lord. Uh, he had a long extended battle with Parkinson's disease. So now he is pain-free uh, with the Lord today. And uh, we just wanna take a moment just to honor and remember Howard. I know that for 
many of you, he needs no introduction and he left an undeniable mark upon your life. Uh, others of you, maybe that's the first time you're hearing that name. Uh, but I want you to know that if you enjoy or if you have been the recipient of just um, a healthy culture around here, like our church has really impacted you in big ways. I want you to know that Howard's DNA and fingerprints are and continue to be all over our church. Uh, he served our church from 1983 to 2007 as lead pastor. Uh, he and his wife, Martha, both were so involved around here. And uh, Howard was, you know, if, if he was the epitome of a pastor. Okay, and I think about like in the encyclopedia, if there's the word pastor, it would have a picture of Howard Brammer. And uh, he was just steady. Uh, he had a, a certain kind of charisma, kind of a smoothness about him, but he was humble. He always uh, made you feel like you were the most important person in the room when he spoke to you. Uh, his wife, Martha, uh, who is living in Cincinnati now, she uh, was flamboyant and artistic. In fact, uh, she had an art studio at her home when they lived here in Indy for a while. And she taught my son art lessons when he was in elementary school. They just loved our family so well. Uh, my first introduction to Howard, um, we, we didn't get to work with each other. Um, he had retired in June of 2007. I came in November. Uh, and the first time I met him, I was already pretty well along in my interview with the elders. And uh, you know, I said, you, you know, you may wanna go to Cincinnati and, and meet with Howard. And so I go to Cincinnati, we sit down on a park bench and we talk for about two hours. And, and, and I remember his words, he said, this, this feels a little weird. It feels like I'm interviewing a new husband for my wife. <laughs> I was like, Howard, you're right. That's kind of a weird analogy, but, um, but it felt very, very similar uh, to that. And uh, man, right from the beginning, you know, Howard, um, was my biggest cheerleader, my biggest encourager. Uh, I would hear from him often. Uh, anytime he was in town, he would make his way back to my office and he'd just be beaming. And he's like, I can't believe what God's doing in our church. And uh, I just appreciated his encouragement and his belief so much. You know, if he ever had a different opinion than I did, which happened on, on a few different occasions, he'd just come talk to me directly and respectfully and then publicly he'd be supportive. And it just meant so much. I told him over and over again, man, I'm standing on your shoulders. And so I just want you to know, we have a healthy church, large in part due to Howard. He is the longest tenured pastor in our nearly 200 year history. And so I just wanna honor him and just thank him for all that he's done. He's in heaven right now, celebrating with us. And um, uh, this last Tuesday, our, our staff gets together every Tuesday and prays together. And one of our longtime staff members, uh, Sherry Follett, she stood up and she reminded us of something that Howard used to do all the time. Uh, in his teaching and when he was up front, he loved to sing. And he would oftentimes just break out into song and lead our church in songs a cappella. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but it's not really my thing. And uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe it should be, I don't know. But, but anyway, his favorite song was uh, a song we sang last week at Easter, We Exalt Thee. So here's what I wanna do to honor Howard. Uh, can I just lead us a cappella, two refrains of that song, We Exalt Thee. If you're at one of our campuses, I just wanna ask you to join in with us. Don't just, just watch. Let, let's just lift our voices and sing. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt Thee, O Lord. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee, O Lord. Let's be a church that is known by its convictions. That, that church has great values and they're, they're uncompromising in biblical truth. But at the same time, my friends, members of the Traders Point Church, we should be the kindest, the most gentle, the most winsome people that anybody ever runs into. So as we launch into our exciting future, as we begin to fulfill the vision we just don't ignore culture. We don't just sit back and criticize culture, and we don't allow culture to suck us into its values, but we engage it. We transform it. We can do that if we will use strength and beauty, zeal and knowledge, grace and truth.
Every time I walk out of the house, put on another face just to blend in with the crowd so nobody sees me. You would never believe me. I tell you that I'm whole, but I'm still healing. I tell you that I'm happy, but I'm grieving. Thought I was a fighter. I'm still in the fire. But if I'm Today, we're beginning a five-week series of messages, and the title of this series talk comes directly out of a lyric of that song, Weeds in My Garden. And what we're going to be talking about over the next five weeks is a subject that every single one of us listening to the sound of my voice right now have either gone through, are going through, or we know somebody that is close to us who we care about very much that is struggling, and it's the subject of mental health and anxiety. Now, Uh, The first time that I did a series on this subject in particular, now I've preached on it a lot since then, but the first time I did a concentrated series on this was about six years ago. And we called that series On Edge. And the response to that was overwhelming. And we unpacked just some biblical principles around the subject of anxiety and some practical helps as best as we knew how to do. And I think that, you know, at the time, I was uh, maybe a little bit more nervous about that series than, than most, just because I know how heavy this topic is and the amount of pain that surrounds this. It's almost like that board game operation. It's just real easy to bump up against somebody's wounds. And so we walked through that series, and I think that the reason why the response was so huge at that time was that many sociologists will tell us that we entered into what is known as an age of anxiety somewhere around 2015. Now, mental health and anxiety have been an issue much, much longer than that, but right around that time is when a lot of the statistics jumped. And we'll look at a number of the reasons for that here in just a bit and throughout this series. And a lot of the aspects that we covered then in that series uh, have unfortunately kind of become the norm for us today. Like I said, all of us have either gone through, are going through, or we know somebody who's right now like struggling with some aspect of their mental health. Now, when I finished that series back in 2016 or 2018, 
um, I remember getting done with it and just uh, feeling, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good about it. Like we'd unpacked a lot of biblical concepts. We'd offered some practical helps. Here's what I thought going out of the series. I felt like I went into it not knowing as much as I should, came out of it knowing more than I did. And I thought, you know, I, I think if anybody that I know goes through something with their mental health or if I go through something, and, and in that series, if you were here for it, I actually got real vulnerable with you and shared with you about a season of my life where I really struggled with my mental health, uh, the worst year of my life up to that point, 2005. And there was a lot of different reasons for that. I almost got out of ministry a couple different times. It was a rough, rough year. And uh, so I thought, you know what? Um, coming out of that series back in 2018, I thought I got a better handle on this than I ever have. I think I'm prepared for the future. Then 2020 happened. And all of us know, like all of us, I think every single one of us, our mental health, uh, we struggled that year, maybe for uh, in different ways and in, in different reasons, but we all likely have our story. And I certainly have mine. Like 2020 replaced 2005 as the worst year of my life. And I could actually even pinpoint it. Uh, June of 2020 was the worst month of my life in the worst year of my life. The second week of June was the worst week of my life within the worst month, within the worst year. And Tuesday was the worst day of my life within the week, within the worst week, within the worst month, within the worst year. And it was just a dumpster fire that month. And some of you remember it. There's a lot of different reasons for that. There were uh, riots going on in every major city, including Indy. And racial tensions were high. There was all kinds of opinions around the pandemic. Should we open? Should we not? Should we wear masks? Should we not? All these kinds of issues that had divided us, made us angry and anxious. And during that time, I, as I look back over 2020, you know, there's lots of things that I would have maybe done differently or uh, as I kind of, you know, reverse, you know, diagnose it. But I was trying my best primarily to just pastor our church through the storm. And it was extremely difficult because it didn't matter what I said or did, it was usually wrong to about half of you. And so it's like, if I said something that was the wrong thing, if I didn't say something, you should have said something. If I said something, you said it too passionately or you should have said it passionately, more passionately. And so I kind of got to this place where June of 2020, like it was all building. And um, every year for the past decade uh, in June, I go out with a group of about 15 to 20 pastors and leaders from around the country to Montana to this retreat called The Refuge. And it's five days where we literally get off the grid. We, we go to Montana, our cell phones do not work. We pull up to the driveway, they stop working, there is no Wi-Fi. it is glorious. For five whole days, we're off, the, I, I just shut my phone off, like it doesn't even work. And we uh, fish and we sit around campfires and uh, we have table talk for about two hours after dinner every night. Uh, I've done this every year for about the last 10 years. And it is one of the things that I would attribute just keeping me emotionally and spiritually healthy and in this thing that, that I do every year, the refuge. Well, June of 2020, it's time to go to the refuge. And the refuge that year was anything but. Everything's like, you know, feels like it's coming apart at the seams. We're ready to go to the refuge. And I kind of wondered, should I go? Should I not? Should I stay? Uh, the state of Montana got shut down. So we literally couldn't even get into the state. So we switched the refuge retreat to Topeka, Kansas, which is a lot like Man Montana, except that it is not. <laughs> and so, you know, I leave and I'm like wondering, should I leave? And I get there now. Now here's the thing, like I, uh, um, I'm just one of the uh, organizers of the group. In other words, like I usually send out the invites. So if I meet a pastor or a leader during the year, and they're doing a good job, but they're lonely, they need community, they need people around them, I'll usually invite them to refuge. And so I, I'm kind of one of the ones that sort of sets the tone for the week. So usually a lot of the guys are kind of looking to me to set the tone. And I go to refuge in Topeka, Kansas in June of 2020. And when I rolled in there, man, I was not doing well, like at all. And I remember it came to a head one day when uh, my phone is constantly buzzing with one crisis after another. And I got to the point where I was like scared to look at it because it was usually either a comment or an email that was coming in like a hand grenade. And I'm trying to put out all these fires and deal with stuff. And it felt like I was completely inadequate at all of it. And then I'm also the chairman of a board of a church planning organization. So I get a phone call from the president. We're out like fishing. And he says, hey, we've got a crisis. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, tell me something, you know, that I don't know. And then he says this, he says, uh, we just had a board member resign due to something that another board member tweeted. 
What do you want to do? And at that point, I just wanted to throw my phone into the water. And I'm just going to tell you guys this, like I lost it. Uh, I don't know about you, like when you, if you've ever had like a panic or an anxiety attack, for me, I've had, I've had a, a couple of them. Um, it, it, I, I get all this pressure uh, in my neck, like right behind my ears. And it felt like somebody strapped me with a thousand pound weight and it just felt crushing. And I about melted down. And I'm with this group of guys. It was a beautiful day. I remember the sun was shining, but it was not shining in here. And I remember a number of them kept looking at me. And I must have had this look on my face like that I did not look good. And they said, Aaron, are you okay? I got that question a dozen times that day. And I lied every single time. And I was like, yep, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Until I wasn't. And that night at dinner, um, we were all sitting around this big table and it was table talk time and it gets around to me and I completely lost it. Broke down, weeping, like ugly crying with a group of like 20 guys that all just sat there in silence listening to me weep. And I was ready to tap out. I was ready to, I was already putting together my resignation letter on my drive back to Indy. Like I'm, I'm ready to be done. Now that's my story. What's yours? And what I want you to know is that if you feel alone in your struggle with mental health, like whatever it is, I want you to know that you're not alone. And I want you to know that it's okay to not be okay. And the only thing that's not okay is to stay not okay. Okay? All right, so, so, so the idea is, is that we want to meet you in that space. Like you don't, like just like the words of that song. We oftentimes want to just kind of present roses when there's weeds in our garden. And it's okay to have some weeds in our garden. What we want to do is we want to just be very real about that. And as Christians, I think that in the past, perhaps, you know, I don't want to throw everybody into one big giant category, but we've meant well, but we haven't always dealt with this subject in ways that were super helpful. And there's a number of different reasons for that. What we want to do is just like, no, no, like immediate answers, no silver bullets, no quick fixes, no yeah, buts, no, have you prayed about it? Just sit in it and just go, oh man, I've been there and it's okay to not be okay because we've all been through it or are in it right now. And we need to throw each other some lifelines. I love how Pastor Ben Kacharis says this. He says, we have a problem. Emotional well-being is in serious decline. It's a palpable crisis that was bad before the pandemic. The isolation, social upheaval, polarization, and massive changes with work, school, and life have exacerbated the crisis, creating an extended ambiguity and heightened stress that's a perfect cocktail for burnout and emotional struggle. No wonder the World Health Organization's recent scientific brief states that the global prevalence of anxiety and depression has increased 25% since the pandemic's arrival in early 2020. Recent surveys reveal that there is a radical downturn in attitudes and soaring levels of anxiety and worry on all fronts. So if you just look at the national stats, anxiety is now the number one issue for women. Um, it is the number two issue for men right behind drugs and alcohol, which I suspect anxiety is number one for men also. It's just that we are masking it with drugs and alcohol to the point that they've become the greater problem. Uh, mental health disorders are the leading cause of disability worldwide, affecting one in five adults, and the percentage is growing. Uh, Generation Z, those bef born between 1999 and 2015, is the most stressed out generation ever. In recent years, the share of high school students who say that they experience, quote, persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness has rose from 26% to 44%, the highest levels of sadness ever recorded. That should like break our hearts. 50% of parents say that they've noticed like just an increase in sadness, anxiety, and depression in their teens since the pandemic. Many children and young adults are fearful, sad, hopeless, and struggling with life. And as a result, suicide has become 
epidemic. It is now the second leading cause of death for young people ages 10 to 24. And because of that, we're going to take a week and we're going to address that subject in particular here in a couple of weeks. Now, those are the national statistics. So here's the question that I had as we were kind of prepping for the series. I just wondered uh, how closely are those reflected like in our own church family? And so several weeks ago, we surveyed about 5,000 of you across all of our locations and online. And here are the results, right? This is us. So 5,000 surveys, nearly 5,000 surveys completed. Uh, Almost 3,000 were women, uh, 2,000 were men. Uh, Can I just say to the guys, uh, way to go. Seriously, like most surveys where men and women are kind of surveyed, it's the women who participate way more than the men. I was actually pretty pleased with that. So guys, thank you for coming and playing ball, all right? Average age of the responder in their uh, uh, late 30s. If we go to the next one here, um, 92% of us, we say that we know someone struggling with mental health, 92%. Um, Here were the uh, results here, 72% say that uh, it's struggles with anxiety and worry. In fact, 80% of our women in our church identified this as their top struggle. Uh, About 72% of men say that it's burnout uh, or 72% total, 68% of men identified the top struggle as burnout and stress. If we go to the next slide, uh, these are respondents 30 and under, ages 18 to 24, the most likely to identify suicide and self-harm as something they struggle with. And 94% know somebody who is struggling with their mental health. Guys, that, that, that's us. And when we first got these stats back, we, somebody from our team, we were kind of looking at this and somebody just kind of casually, this comment spilled out of them. They said, it's amazing all of the things that we can keep hidden. In other words, we, we present roses hoping you won't see the weeds in my garden. And we need to be honest that we're not always honest. Just like the lyric from that song that we heard a little bit earlier. Now, maybe that was the first time you heard that song. The the artist, her name is Kendall Inskeep. She's a believer. She lives in Nashville. And she actually recorded um, her testimony around how and why she wrote that song. And I want you to hear directly uh, from Kendall in this video. My name is Kendall Inskeep. Um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm a singer-songwriter for Warner Chapel and Cormier Music. There's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain that is deep-rooted in my story. Ended up kind of rebelling when I was a late teenager. I was so angry at God. I knew he was there, but I had never had a relationship with him. I was at the point in my life where I did not want to be here anymore. My family, I hadn't talked to them in probably a year. They were like, okay, you need help. So I went to a facility for two months and I started journaling to Jesus. And I had read this journal entry to one of my friends and I read her this journal entry. We prayed about it. We asked Jesus to just remove this from Kindle. And I felt this overwhelming peace and joy. That is the day that Jesus met me where I was. Songhouse is this collaborative workshop for TikTok, Instagram, social media platforms. Um, The founder is Tyler Ward. We all go into this loft on Wednesdays and Saturdays. We're paired into random groups and we have 30 minutes to write a pre-chorus and a chorus. So the day we wrote Honest, I was just getting out of a really bad funk and my passions and my desire to do the things that I love just kind of were just depleted. I felt defeated. And so I called Tyler that day and I was like, I'm not coming in. I'm I'm not gonna write anything good. Just totally allowing the enemy to get to me. He's like, Kendall, you're gonna put two feet on the ground. You're gonna get your butt up and you're gonna come into Songhouse today. So I get there, we have a round or whatever I asked him to leave again. Like, I'm crying every 10 seconds. Like, I'm just like a mess. But messes become messages, you know? He's like, no, you're staying. And then we get into the room and we're all going through the same thing in different ways. And the concept was honesty. And we're like, what if we're being honest about not being honest with ourselves? 
it was like boom. And we wrote this song in like, I'm not even kidding, probably 15 minutes. That raw emotion that you might see in the video, that was exactly how I was feeling that day. Turns out, a lot of other people were feeling that way too. I think, you know, one of the lines that everybody tends to go to is the, I'll give you roses, just hoping you don't see the weeds in my garden. It made me stop in my tracks because it was like, if you can't even be honest with yourself, how are you being honest with the Lord? So that's not very authentic to our relationship. And how are you going to be able to fix me if I don't even give you those pieces? And so it was a moment of surrender. To anybody going through a season of defeat, allow yourself to feel it. But do not allow, you, allow that specific pain or suffering to determine your future. Your pain will be turned into something beautiful. Your weeds will be turned into roses at some point. So keep faith in that and know that. Because she or he who believes that the Lord will fulfill his promises is blessed. Well said, well said. So here's where we're going. This is the introductory message for the next uh, four weeks together. So what I wanna do in the remainder of our time is I just wanna lay out some working principles that are kind of gonna undergird our time together in this very heavy, like weighty topic. And this is not an exhaustive list of principles by any stretch of the imagination. I'm sure I could probably list a bunch more, but here's maybe the top three that come to mind. If you're taking notes, jot these down. Here's principle number one. As we, as a, as a church family, just wanna think about this complicated issue. To address a complicated problem, we need to widen our perspective. And I think it's really common to want to reduce a complex problem to a narrow solution, like a one size fits all silver bullet kind of a thing. And mental health is a very complex issue and it's compo composed of what we could say uh, four primary buckets or categories. So let me list them and then I'll actually unpack it, kind of explain what I mean here in just a few minutes. But uh, situational, clinical, medical, and spiritual. And all of them require in a different approach to address it. And Jesus actually touched on all four in various ways throughout the gospel and the collective of his teaching. In Luke chapter four, we can just start here. Jesus described what it is that he had come to do in verses 18 and 19. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring, here it is, good news. So what Jesus brings is good news to the poor, and he has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So Jesus brings good news, not just for an eternal destiny one day when you die, but for good news in the here and now. In fact, in John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. And this is not some sort of a, I'm just gonna sweep it under the rug, pretend like everything is okay, but it's experiencing a peace, as we're gonna look at in another passage here in a minute, that just surpasses all understanding. That Jesus desires to give us fullness of life. He desires to bring healing to body, soul, and mind. In fact, in Mark chapter five, there is a guy who is possessed by a demon. He's known as the Gerasene demoniac. And he was out of control. He was hopeless and he was self-harming. All symptoms very similar to people that are in emotional distress today. And it says in that passage that Jesus restored him to peace of mind. When Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, which is the longest sermon that he ever taught, uh, we take a look at that mountain sermon and we see that Jesus was concerned with many of the things that we label under mental health Today, Sermon on the Mount included the themes of anxiety, prayer, forgiveness, and inner authenticity, showing us that Jesus' teaching of the kingdom of God was very, very much concerned about our mental health. In other words, good mental health is a trait of life in the kingdom of God, redeemed men and women. Um, Proverbs chapter 23 says, as you think, so you are. 
it's this like battleground of the mind that, that actions started in your mind. Disposition started in your mind. So if you remember a few weeks ago, when we talked about the Holy Spirit, we said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is telling you truths and rehearsing truths to you. And then you've got the word of God that, that is there. When you read the word of God under the filling and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that, that's what brings that word of God to life for your specific situation. So if the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, then there are unholy spirits that are lying to you. So Satan is the father of lies. He is an accuser and a deceiver, and it starts in your mind. And so you've got to ask yourself, what voice, what spirit am I listening to in my mind? And it's clear that Jesus' ministry extended beyond just like trying to get souls into heaven. He was concerned about the whole person bringing the kingdom of God and kingdom living to the here and the now. Matthew summarized Jesus' focus this way in chapter four. It says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing, here's this term again, the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness, every kind. So it doesn't just say like he healed physically lame people. We would take that to include, he also healed people that were struggling in their mental health. Uh, verse 24, news about him spread as far as Syria and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. I just want you to see that uh, people were drawn to Jesus. They were pursuing him. Now, Mark chapter nine. It says that there's Jesus' disposition towards all of us. When he saw the crowds, he didn't shame them. He didn't judge them. He didn't bemoan them. No, what did, what did he do? He had compassion on them. Why? Because they were confused and they were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. That is the heart of God. And if you want to know what God is like, you look to Jesus because Jesus was fully God in a body. God embodied. And so He's showing us that he has compassion upon us and people were drawn to him. And when they came, he healed them. So if our mission as a church is to remove unnecessary barriers that keep people to Jesus, because people are naturally being drawn to Jesus, we're just trying to remove all the unnecessary obstacles that would stand in their way. Then speaking to the subject of mental health, offering tangible hope, and help, not just simplistic or overly spiritualized answers should be part of our mission as well. So situational, medical, clinical, spiritual. Here's what I mean by those terms. Some mental health issues that all of us walk through, you and me together, are caused by the unique situation that you or somebody that you know and love may be currently traveling through. It's situational. So here's what I mean. Some seasons of life are more stressful and anxiety inducing than others. So that could mean like right now, you're a high school student getting ready to graduate. You don't know what you're gonna do next year. Uh, you're a college student, you just graduated. You're, you're trying to get your feet underneath you. You're trying to afford you know, a house. You're trying to get a job. All, all that kind of transitional change. Maybe right now, uh, a relationship is falling apart. A marriage has ended. Uh, there is a national crisis or a personal crisis that has blown like a storm into your life, disorienting you. Situational stress. And what I would simply say is, I remember talking to my grandma on the phone during the pandemic and she's since gone on to be with the Lord, but I'll never forget what she said to me one afternoon as we're talking on the phone. She said, Aaron, this too shall pass. What a great phrase. This too shall pass. It's understanding that if the situation blew in, give it some time that it's gonna blow out. And I would simply, somebody needs to hear this today because right now your pain is at a fever pitch. And I just wanna look at you and say, hey, hold on, this too shall pass. Don't make permanent decisions based on temporary feelings and emotions. So some of it is situational. Here, here's the next thing, and that is uh, clinical. So uh, some, some mental health issues are due to just the biological or chemical way that we are wired up and it is the result of being in a fallen world. Let, let me explain it uh, this way. Our, our, our feelings, biology, chemistry uh, has been affected by a fallen world. So 
just like your physical body has. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to identify it or raise your hand, but I would imagine that every single one of you has some sort of physical feature that about yourself that you're just not all that excited about. Am I right? No? Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, like, I, I look in the mirror all the time and immediately I go to the negative. I think my ears stick out too much. I don't like my legs. Stop looking at them. I know you are, right? So just stop it. <laughs> stop diagnosing it. I don't need any of that pressure, all right? So, so we all kind of have like, there's just some things about us that we physically that are just kind of the result of a fallen world. I'm looking so forward to having a new body and a new heaven and a new earth. Same thing is true chemically. Same thing is true biologically. You might need some temporary helps. You might need some professionals to come into your, there's no shame in any of that. Some of our mental health issues are d- just due to some of that. Now, now others, and this would just maybe kind of be one of the last things that we had mentioned, are the result of maybe wrestling with spiritual issues. Maybe, maybe that is connected to, to sin or, or faith issues. Now, when we as believers get too narrow in our thinking around what mental health is and how to address it, then the negative effects of that can be incredibly damaging. Here's what I mean. When we make an issue spiritual, when it's actually situational or medical, or somebody comes to us and they're coming undone with their mental health, and that makes us uncomfortable because it's brushing up against our own wounding or our own shame. And so we we don't really know how to deal with it. So it's just like, stop it. Or we're just trying to fix it too easily. And that requires a lot, that ends up impacting uh, and does a lot of damage. When it's not about a lack of faith, it's not necessarily about a lack of unconfessed sin, but maybe it's a chemical wiring. You would never look at a person that is struggling with uh, kidney failure and suggest that that's due to a sin issue. No, you would say, go get dialysis. See, think of mental health issues like waves at a lake. Let's just say you're at the lake. Lord willing, that'll be very, very soon. Can I get a good amen? Right, that's right. We're gonna be at the lake. It's gonna be warm soon enough, right? So, so you're, you're at the lake, you're by the bank. Maybe you're on a raft. You're just trying to enjoy the calm water of the lake. It's a gorgeous day. And all of a sudden these waves start coming in. And I would just say, that's like the waves of mental health. Now, some, now not all waves are created by the same sources. So some of those waves are due to the effects of others somebody else's decisions, the thing that somebody else did to hurt you. So if you're at the lake, maybe waves are coming in. It's because some people are on some wave runners and they're creating waves. Some waves are just because um, the wind's picked up. You can't do anything about that. That's just sort of like life. And so now you've got some white caps that are rolling in uh, because of, of the wind that's picked up. Some, some waves are due to maybe I, I took some rocks and I kind of threw them into the water and it created some waves. So, so not all the waves are from the same source. A complicated problem requires us to widen our perspective. Principle one. Here's principle two. Meaningful relationships are absolutely critical for good mental health. And this one's really, really tricky because quite possibly uh, the cause of your poor mental health is due to someone else. And relationships are like everything else in this fallen world. They are fallen. And people have the tremendous capability of helping you. They also have the tremendous capability of hurting you. That's really, really unfortunate. And just like all of, all of us have been helped by people, we are not self-made men and women. If I, I were to say, hey, give me the names of some people who believed in you, gave you an opportunity, um, led you to Christ, gave you hope, you'd probably be able to rattle off a couple names. If I were to say, um, Give me the names of some people who hurt you, set you back, uh, wounded you, scarred you. You'd probably be able to rattle off some names. There's oftentimes what we do, natural human reaction. If you touch a hot stove, you pull back. That's a natural human reaction and that is warranted. Just don't stay pulled back. And some of us have kind of pulled back from relationships and we're isolated and we're alone. We live in a society right now where we become so busy that we don't have time to invest in meaningful relationships. And it's having a massive impact on our mental health, especially men. One in seven men right now say they have no close friends. That's a, uh, a five-fold increase since 1990. 20% of single men say they don't have a single close friend. And some of us have maybe pulled back. Some of us, we communicate just purely over keyboards and devices, and we need the interaction of other human beings in our life. We've got to invest in relationships. When I look at Jesus, the the most uh, maybe stressful moment of his life, arguably, could be the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion. 
And it says there that he was filled with such anguish that he was sweating drops of uh, like sweat and blood mixed together. That's how much anguish and anxiety he was under. And what, what did he want? He wanted community. He wanted relationships. He was asking the disciples to pray with him. And if Jesus needed that, then you and I need that as well. Ecclesiastes chapter four says, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. Now listen to this last uh, sentence. Someone who falls alone is in real trouble. And so if you've pulled back, isolated, I get it, I understand. I wanna just, on your timetable, invite you back into community. So that's principle one and two. Here's the third principle. And that is, we've got to think about what we think about. We've got to recognize that uh, not every thought, even though every thought might um, be real, might be, it might be what you're feeling, not every thought is true. And so a thought may come into your mind, but you need to tell that thought where to go if it is not helpful or of the Lord. We gotta watch what we think about. Now, I think that this is one of the reasons statistically why this issue has blown up in recent years. Uh, and I, I'm not down on screens, online or cell phone, but what it's done is it's isolated us from people. Have you noticed this? People will say far meaner things to other people online than they would face to face. And we've all got these screens and our back pockets are on our in our purses that are constantly uh, doing this. Look at me, look at me, look at me, hear me, listen to me. And what it is is all these mixed messages and they know that the only way to get your attention is fear, anger, and anxiety. So let me just tell you something that's gonna stir you up. And just a constant barrage of that just kind of gets you like all worked up. And especially once again, in this year where we've got a contentious, divisive presidential election coming in November, it's just gonna continue to get ramped up. And so this is where we've gotta really stop and pay attention to watching what we watch and watching what we allow into our minds. So let me just say this, uh, keeping up with the news and world events is not a bad thing to do. In fact, I would say as Christ followers, we should do that. In the Old Testament, it says the men of Issachar understood the times in which they live, therefore they knew what to do. So you don't just like run and stick your head in the sand. However, you can do that in about five to seven minutes a day. You don't need to have the channel on all day long with the talking heads stirring up anxiety, fear, and anger. It's not helpful. Maybe the most spiritual thing you could do is take your phone and put on do not disturb or just shut it off and just say, everybody shut up but Jesus. I need to take some time to just watch what I think about and ask myself, is this of God or is this not? Now, I think that part of the reason why Paul wrote to the Philippian church was because they were a church dealing with their mental health. That term is not mentioned in the passage, but it's there. And listen to what Paul writes in verses six and seven. He says to them, and he could easily be saying this to you and me today, don't worry about anything. Like, yeah, right. But then he doesn't say never worry. He says, don't worry. And then notice what he says next. Instead, pray about everything. And I love that because what prayer is, is worry directed to God. Um, uh, worry is prayer directed to you. It's just you talking to yourself about problems. Every now and then I'll have people come up to me and they're like, yeah, I really want to enhance my prayer life, but I don't really know what to pray. And I'm like, are you worried about anything? They're like, yeah. I'm like, man, you got lots of material. <laughs> just take that and just direct it towards God. So that's what Paul says. And then he says this, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Is it just me or I have the first part of that down, but I forget the next part. I'm constantly telling God what I need. And to my shame, I'm very rarely thanking him for all that he has done. And then in verse seven, it says, then you will experience. He didn't say no. He says, you'll experience God's what? His peace, which you cannot explain. It surpasses anything you can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That is so practical. That the way to guard our hearts and our minds is to fill our thoughts and our minds with what God says is true. 
In Romans chapter 12, it says, be renewed by the transforming of your mind. And this is a work that God does. So this is so practical. Uh, scientists actually talk about this. It's like reshaping your neurological pathways. And you can do that. The plasticity of your mind. And so when a thought enters your mind, you're like, you stop. And you're like, nope, I'm gonna, that is not of the spirit of God. And I'm gonna tell you where to go. Now, I know you can do this. It may seem like you can't. I know you can. If you've ever potty trained a toddler or house trained a puppy, you can train your thoughts. Because when a puppy makes a mess in the kitchen, what do you do? You, you clean it up and then you train. Same thing is true with your thoughts. And I wanna end with this, this visual illustration. Paul goes on in that passage to say, instead, like whatever is true, honorable, right, admirable, uh, praiseworthy, think about those things. Dwell on those things. So these black ping pong balls just maybe represent anxious thoughts, worries, concerns. Oh, one almost got away from me. Uh, fear. So I'm sure you could probably uh, name a number of these right now. Like, you know, maybe right now for you, it's uh, an economic thing. Maybe it's your marriage, your kids. Um, maybe it's a health thing. Maybe it's uh, the eclipse has got you a little uneasy. You know, we'll throw that in there. Uh, the no presidential election coming up. Uh, maybe this new bird flu thing going around. You know, all the, all the headlines, all these thoughts want to get away from me. And... Uh, and you're just, you're just like, you've just got these like negative thoughts that are just filling your mind all the time. Like every time you turn on the TV, open your phone. Now, here's what Paul says. Paul just didn't say, stop it. He says, fill your minds with whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, whatever is worthy of praise. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this as I've been pouring this in, nothing seems to be moving. And for some of you, you're like, uh, Aaron, I've done that or I did that. I checked that box. I went through rooted. I got baptized last week at Easter. I think I've been doing this. Nothing seems to be changing. My mental health isn't changing. I would just simply say, man, keep going. Whatever is true, whatever is admirable, whatever is worthy of praise, man, you think about these things and you begin to watch as God begins to push out some of these thoughts that are not of the spirit of God. And it's a process as you begin to retrain your mind and to fill your mind. And the negative thoughts that are left over, you just tell them where to go. You just get it out of there, all right? Now, here's why I just, want, I just want to invite you back. This is not like a quick fix, trying to fix you, solve all your problems. It's just an honest conversation to go, man, it's okay to not be okay. We've all got weeds in our garden. And we want to come before God uh, just as we are and allow Him to transform our minds because you're a whole person. You're not just an eternal soul. You're a body and you're a mind. And Jesus is concerned about all of that. So let's just go to him in prayer as we kick off this series. Father, we come to you right now. I know this is a big issue. I know it's heavy. I know it's painful. I know somebody right now is maybe right in the thick of it. And I just pray that they would know that they are seen, that they are loved just as they are. And that they might have an encounter with you in the midst of this series together as we uh, seek uh, the wisdom of your word on this subject. There isn't anybody that knows more about this than you. And so Father, I just pray that you would bring some real tangible help and some hope to those and to those that we know and love who are struggling with their mental health because we know that you are the great physician and that you can bring healing and that you look upon each one of us with compassion. And so we devote this time to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, would you go ahead and stand with us? Let's enter back into worship.
to begin this really important sermon series. And we want you to know that we always have a prayer response team on the, along the walls. And there may be two responses you need to make today. One, you may be ready to give your life to Jesus to make the most important decision you'll ever make to start following Jesus. We want to celebrate with you and help you know your next step. Or you may just need somebody to pray with you, to pray over you, whatever you have going on in your life. We believe there is power in prayer, so please let us pray with you before you go. Hey, let's have an awesome week. Take the love of Jesus everywhere we go, where we live, where we work, where we play. Have an awesome week. We'll see you back next Sunday, and go Boilers.